David is very kind. And Walt, what a, uh, what a great set that we have there. And to start with the doxology, doxology in Jude 24, and to have those little words to be presented blameless before his great glory with great joy. And that's hard in our day, isn't it? There's so much to discourage us, so much to get us down, so many things we can complain about. And yet there are always those Christians, it seems, that have joy, right? They seem to always be positive and optimistic. Um, you could have a Christian who's sick and they've got bad financial problems and they're in a bad relationship and yet they sit there with joy and optimism and um, I mean, they could be in jail, they could be in a Philippian jail, they could be there at midnight and they have this joy that exudes through a kind of you know, just incomprehensible positivity that's just hard for us. Matter of fact, it's something that I think a lot of us meet with skepticism. It's like, come on, you're putting me on, right? This is too much, you, this can't be real. You, you must not be really feeling this. Well, I've been around enough in church work and dealing with God's people to know, um, you know, for some, it's, it's not an act. They're not putting on. They have a depth of joy no matter what the circumstances are. And there's a secret to that, I've learned. And I learned to stop being skeptical of that. There is a secret, it's an open secret, and it's given to us in scripture. There's one thing that I find is a commonality between all those people that have that really inexpressible kind of positivity when you think they should be negative and moaning and complaining. And that's found in Colossians chapter one. I wanna turn it to, turn you to it this morning. I want you to look at it and say, this is the open secret of scripture that can take what for most of us is a bad attitude we often seem to carry through life that's always based on the circumstances that we have before us and to say, wait a minute, if I could work on this spiritual discipline right here, if I could have this particular thing as the purposeful discipline of my life, I could really see the effect on my disposition. I could see it change the way I view things. And it's um, right there for us, it really is as Paul ended to the Thessalonians a very simple thing to give thanks, there's the, there's the secret, in all circumstances for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. This is it. If you could just learn to purposefully, decision with your mind, volitionally decide, I am going to choose to give thanks in all circumstances. Now Paul does a lot of what we get, I'm sure, in class, we get in sermons, we get in chapel, and that is people get up with the Bible and they say, here's what the Bible says we ought to do and we ought to be working and making progress and doing it. And that's super important, that's the job of preaching, that's the job of scripture, it's like a mirror, it shows us what's messed up and we need to be conformed to the image of Christ. But in the middle of Paul's prayer here in chapter one, Something changes in those, in those verses, like verses nine through 11 there. All these things that, that are progressively happening, things they need to do. They need to walk worthy you know, of, of this calling that they've had, worthy of the Lord, all those. But then in verse number 12, he says, I, I give thanks for these things, things that they can give thanks for, and these are things that are not progressive. These are things that you don't have to aspire to. These are things that just are true. They're always true, completely true. They're true for a Christian that's been a Christian for 62 years, they're true for a Christian that's been a Christian for 62 minutes. These are things that are true for everyone. And I love the set that we just sang because it's all rooted in that. And unfortunately, we can yawn our way through these kinds of truths that we just sang about. No matter how beautiful the music is, no matter how well written and prayerful the lyrics are, we can say, yeah, yeah, I know that, I know that, I know that. But the things that Paul says here that we ought to be giving thanks for, the things that he is giving thanks for, the things that I find that the people who can be laid open with their back split in a prison unjustly being accused in stocks at midnight can have joy, really can express joy. They can have that disposition because they are camping every day, I know, on these truths right here. So let's look at these real quickly. Verse number 12, Paul says, here's what I can give thanks for. I'm giving thanks to the Father Here's the first thing, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Qualified you. There's the key word, qualified you. Completely qualified you. Is the 62 year old Christian who's been walking with the Lord for 40 years qualified? Qualified. Is the thief on the cross, the moment he transfers his trust, is he qualified? Fully qualified. The, completely qualified, 100% qualified. He can step into, this is a future reality, the inheritance of the saints in light. 
Now, I know we don't fully appreciate where we're going like we ought to, and that ought to be a homework assignment. We really should spend more time in the last two chapters of the Bible. But you do need to recognize, once we get excited about that, we start to really think that there's a city coming down out of heaven, here it is, like a bride adorned for her husband. I know we're used to that analogy that we are the bride of Christ, but in that case, that city is like a bride coming down an aisle to a very eager groom that can't wait to be married to this woman. And here comes this home. Whatever the best things you've ever experienced in this life, times it by 10, subtract it by anything that makes it bad, that is a place that we're headed, a, an inheritance that is coming for the saints in light. No darkness there, no crying, no mourning, no pain. And this passage says that you are qualified for it if you're a Christian. Qualified, fully, completely qualified. Go on a road trip with me. We're gonna go, we're gonna go to the south, deep south. We're gonna head across the country. We're gonna get into Georgia, we're gonna hit Atlanta. We're gonna head on Highway 20 toward Augusta. It's the afternoon, we've had lunch. And we're driving, we get off on Washington Avenue. We see this nice green hedge to the right. We say, there's a golf course there. We're in Augusta now. And we say, you know what? I'd love to play a little golf this afternoon. Got the clubs in the trunk. Let's pull off here. Looks like a beautiful course. If I can peek through the hedge, I'd like to play golf. So we pull into the guard gate. And you tell the man, I'd like to play some golf this afternoon. And he will say, ha. He will laugh in a very dignified way to tell you, you're, well, you're not playing golf here. And you say, well, I got money. I say, well, we don't care if you have money. Well, you have to be a member to play here. Well, okay, well, I got an inheritance from my grandma last year. I worked hard. I got a bonus. At work. I'd love to join. He'd still laugh at you in a dignified way. You know, there are only 300 members of Augusta National Golf Course, 300 members. And it's not about how much money you have. As a matter of fact, Bill Gates, look this one up, wanted to join Augusta National, but he let it out that he wanted to join Augusta National. And when they found out, they said, well, you're not joining. Uh, we, I mean, we don't take desperate people here, right, <laughs> that, that, that want to join our club. Literally, this is true. For years, they put Bill Gates off, right? At that time, the richest man in the world, not because he didn't have the money, but because, eh, didn't didn't measure up here. Didn't wasn't what I wanted. You know, Jack Nicholas was a member, Warren Buffett was a member, but... I mean, it took a little time. I'm happy to report, if it's going to keep you up at night, that Bill Gates is now a member at Augusta National, but they didn't even want to let him in. And it had nothing to do with his money. See, they have certain standards there at Augusta National. And you can't get in, and I can't get in. It's a very hard and exclusive thing to get into. Well, getting into this little phrase here, the inheritance of the saints in light, Compared to Augusta National, it would be like, I don't know, comparing it to being qualified to walk through a front door of a 7-Eleven or something. You, you, that's, this, this is, there's no club on earth that's exclusive enough to think about how exclusive this is because of how great it is. You can only imagine what it's like to play on that golf course. And I imagine that us as Christians, looking back from heaven's perspective, we're gonna say, I wish I would have spent more time understanding what a great thing this is that God has planned. You know, eye is seen, no ear is heard, mind is conceived, the things that God has planned for those that love him, the ones that he cares about. He's gonna bring a city to you, a reality to you one day that is so good, and the Bible says that right now, you are 100% fully qualified to enter in. And someone else, of course, earned your qualification, which the book of Colossians is gonna unpack. All the problems that you had, the things that are so exclusive that you can't be a part of it, all of that has been purchased for you. Which, by the way, if you want a passage that should remind you of what it takes to get into this inheritance of the saints in light, you could jot down Psalm 5. Psalm 5, verses 4 and 5. That's a great little section because it says this, that, that evil may not dwell with you. So here's the thing. Evil can't dwell with God. And, and I love the fact in verse number 4, it says, it calls them the wicked. And I think, yeah, well, I get that. I wouldn't want the wicked in my neighborhood either. Right? But then he gives two examples of wickedness. Are you ready for these? It says in verse five, the boastful. And then in verse six, let's just keep going. Those who speak lies. Now, you can find an extreme example of that, but let's just think for a second. Boasting, the self-aggrandizement, the, the, the self-promotion, the putting myself in a good light so you'll think better of me. I'm glad no one in this room has ever done that. Or lying, deception. 
So God reminds us, here's what I can't deal with in my club. I can't have sinners here. And then he picks two of the easiest sins for us to commit, which you were committing when you were a toddler, right? Self-promotion and deception. And he says, I can't, I can't have that here. And before you try to downplay that to the people outside of the Biola campus who can't handle that, God's so exclusive, why is God so stuck up, why is God so into perfection? If afterwards you come up and wanna put sand in my eyes, I'm going to object. And if I say, don't put any sand in my eyes, don't put dirt in my eyes, don't rub, you know, don't put that rock in my eye, you are not gonna call me arrogant or exclusive for me not wanting you to put sand in my eyes. Because you don't want sand in your eyes. And it's not that your eyes are arrogant or exclusive or narrow-minded or judgmental. It's just that your eyes aren't designed for those things. And we know for what this is, the amazing creation of your eyeball, it does not function well with sand in it. So we don't want any of that in our eyeballs. And God is so perfect, he's so pure, he cannot dwell, it says, with evil. He can't be good, he can't be copacetic about people that lie or boast, and that's what we are. Put it this way, if Augusta National said, we'll let people in if they're perfect golfers, which of course no one is, right? I mean, think about it. The longest hole on Augusta is number two, and you know people do hit long drives over 500 yards. So think about this, you could create a golf course like Augusta, where you could expect if you hit every shot perfectly, you could come into the clubhouse with an 18 on your scorecard, right? Because the ball goes in the direction you want it to, where it wants every time you swing the club. I was at the gym this morning doing some cardio, looked up on the board, and they were doing a swing analysis of a golfer. You know, and it looked good to me, because you know, if I've ever seen my swing in a picture, I realize that I'm a long way from that, and I said, well, that's, that's a great swing. And someone would even say, this is the flawless golf swing of this golfer. I think it was Rory that was on the screen. And I, I thought, well, that is a good golf swing, right? But it's not a flawless golf swing. Because if it were a flawless golf swing, right, he'd hit the ball where he wants it to go every time. My son, who's a big golfer, he was the captain of his golf team, went a lot of years without hitting a hole in one. Well, he got a hole in one at Black Gold, not too far from here. And he gets this hole in one on the 215 yard par three. And he, of course, he texts me. Thankfully, his brother was there to witness, who never would have admitted it if uh, he'd made this up. And I wanted to rejoice, of course, which I should, but I could have responded in a snarky way and say, finally, the ball went where you were aiming it, right? <laughs> All these years. Think about it, right? You've tried to hit that, par every par three, you've tried to put it right in that hole. And you've done it thousands of times and you've never done it. Well, congratulations for finally hitting it where you want it to go. Well, here's the thing. We always, we talk about par, par. Par is not perfection. And we have a par in our society, and it keeps moving, right? What used to be a par three is now par five in our society. But really, what we need for this place is a place where you don't even have people that boast or lie. And God says, I'm gonna let you into this place. I'm gonna rewire you so that you never even do those things when you get here. And all the problems of lying and boasting and self-promotion and jealousy and envy and all the other things that we could really readily admit to that we're all guilty of, right? Gonna make for a perfect place. And the Bible says, here's the thing, you are fully 100% qualified. You got the green jacket. You are donned in Christ, right? You're clothed in Christ, Paul said in Galatians. You have all of the qualifications the second, the moment you put your trust in Christ. We sang songs about it, but I want you to think about it. I mean, Walt tried to get us to think about it this morning. He said, stop, think about that mercy of God to look at you, a sinner. If I put all your sins up here on the wall, he said, let's project all the sins that you've committed this month. Let's look at some of the really bad things that you did, the things you said, the things you did, the things you thought. I mean, it'd be embarrassing for you, I hope, because we don't measure up. But every single sin is now gone because God has clothed you in Christ. You are 100% qualified and don't start thinking like the world that I wouldn't want to be in a place where everyone's perfect. Trust me, you will want to be in a place where everyone's perfect. You want to be in a place that is perfect and God has designed that for you and when it comes, it's going to come down the aisle, so to speak, of heaven like a bride adorned for her husband and you are going to crave to live in that place. 
You gotta give thanks that that has been secured for you. You are qualified for this, 100% fully qualified. Verse 13, and to be qualified from that, you gotta get out of the mess you're in now. So verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and he's transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness. He's transferred us from the kingdom to the kingdom of his beloved son. There's a lot of good words there. Delivered, transferred, there's great symmetry in this. Domain, right, kingdom. These are great great words, great parallel section of, of our text here. But I want you to think about that concept of being delivered or released from the domain. Unfortunately, in our internet world, our modern world, the word domain has kind of lost its power in English. Domain, talk about, you know, a website, a domain name or whatever. It's, it, it used to have a much stronger sense in English. Um, that Greek word that translates into the word domain, uh, I, I like where it's translated when um, Pilate realizes that Herod is in town, Herod Antipas, when Jesus is being tried. And he says, okay, you're from Nazareth up north, we're here in Judea and Jerusalem. I, Herod's in town, of course he had political reasons for wanting to get tight with Herod, but he says, I'm gonna turn Jesus over to Herod because it's in his domain. It's usually translated jurisdiction, which is a great way to put it. It's a great little Latin compound, juris, law, diction, to speak. And that was the thing about the ancient world. If, if someone had jurisdiction over you, they could say the word and whatever they said, it went. If, if Herod said Jesus dies, then well, then he dies. If he says he lives, he lives. If he's released, if he says that, then he's released. He has the right to speak over you. You're in his domain. Well, remember, if you would, this morning, Ephesians chapter two, that says all of us used to be in a domain in which we walked, in which the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, it was at work in us. And of course, hell, people think, is the domain of Satan, right? But it's not. Hell is not the domain of Satan. He's there to get punished justly, just like everyone who ends up there. His domain is here. He is called, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world. Ephesians chapter two, this domain, this present darkness, he is, he's pulling the strings here. Now, he's a bulldog on a leash, I understand that, but he's got jurisdiction here in many ways. I mean, it's all under the ultimate authority of God, but he's running things here in a way that should at least keep us in our own thinking about the distinction there should always be between the present culture that we live in and the culture that we are supposed to subscribe to. Our citizenship is somewhere else, our jurisdiction is elsewhere. But I want you to think about the fact that when you were a non-Christian, you were under the jurisdiction of the enemy. And here's how the Bible puts it. Think about 1 John. It says you're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. That's such a strong way to put it. But I don't care if you were even a good Bible-toting Sunday school kid that you know, never did anything all that bad. You were boasting and lying, among other things, that God can't handle. But I mean, you still, the Bible says, are under the jurisdiction of the enemy. You're under the jurisdiction of this present darkness. And the Bible says that the whole point of Christ coming to the earth to redeem us, to purchase us, was to get us out of that domain and to get us into the domain of the kingdom. And that's a transaction that took place, if you're a Christian. And it takes place, how? By a moment, in a, in a millisecond, in the timeline of how this all works out, at one moment when you genuinely transferred your trust to the finished work of Christ, you were immediately transferred out of the jurisdiction of the enemy and hell had no claim on you from that point on. Hell had zero claim on you from that point on. Let's take another road trip, this time up the five. We'll go up the five all the way to Marin County. This time you're not in our, you know, our van or whatever. You are now in a county-owned bus with bars on it. This is a sad illustration. And we're heading up to San Quentin. And let's just say it wasn't like it is now, a correctional facility, a penitentiary. Let's say it is what it used to be in biblical times, it was a debtor's prison that you owed money. And it could be because of a crime, but you had to pay back restitution, add a fifth, or whatever it might be. But you are in big, big time debt, whatever the problem was, and you can't get out. But I'm your friend, and I like you, and I wanna get you out. So I come up and visit you all the time. I you know, do all I can to send you letters, and. Sometimes I even try to bake a cake and put a file in it, but it keeps getting stuck at the metal detector. So I've done my best to try and get you out. But I realize your debt is so big. So I go and I find a benefactor, and the benefactor somehow, just for some unthinkable reason, decides to say, I'm gonna put all my money up here and get you out. And so we go to the judges and we sit there, we hire a lawyer, 
And we go here to the Orange County Courthouse and they say, you are now released from this prison. So we drive up the lawyer, the benefactor, and the judge says, I really like this case. I'd like to go myself. And so we all drive up there and we meet you there and you're in your jail clothes. And we said, okay, we're here to spring you out. But this time it won't be with a file and a cake. This time it will be legally and we go there and you've made a mess with all your relationships. You, the warden hates you, the jailers hate you. I mean, everyone there who's in authority, you've just, they just don't like you. I mean, because you owed so much money and you were such trash to them. But we go, we go through all the paperwork, all the concentric circles of security and we go and we march you out. And as soon as we get out, you say, is there an in and out burger in Marin County? You know? And I say, yes. I don't know that there is, but let's just say yes. And so we go to In-N-Out Burger, and you say, I just wanna go in, I wanna see the red and white, I wanna get a double-double, I just wanna go eat. So we go into to In-N-Out Burger. And as we're sitting in In-N-Out Burger, here comes the warden, the jailers, and they sit down at the table behind us, and they sit there and sneer at you, and they sit there and say things to you, and occasionally they'll throw a, you know, a ketchup packet at you, They harass you, but you're sitting there with the lawyer and the benefactor and the judge and me who's tried to get you out and we are all sitting there saying, listen, don't, stop. Stop, stop getting so skittish. Stop worrying about this. And then you see the warden pop and says, mop the floor, boy. And you get up and jump up and immediately you you think, oh, I gotta mop, no, 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 no. Sit back down, sit back down. And I could say all that because those people no longer have any jurisdiction over you. You're not in their domain anymore. And this is the problem with the Christian life. You live being harassed by all the powers of this darkness. You gotta armor up, the Bible says, Ephesians 6, because we are struggling through living in a world that doesn't own you but wants to own you, constantly commanding things of you, throwing things in front of you to lure you out of the relationship you have with the judge and the benefactor and the, and the attorney. And the triune God says, I've sprung you from this. You don't live there anymore. See, the future inheritance is gonna be great. That's when you get a redeemed body. That's when you walk through the gates of the kingdom. Right now, though, you're in the kingdom of his beloved son. You're a card-carrying member. And we need to fight the good fight even when the powers of this present darkness throw their worst darts at you, and you can sit there, even if it's a Philippian jail at midnight, and say, they have no jurisdiction over me. Even the temptations, even the failures of last week, and let's just, let's just quickly get to that. Verse 14, back in our passage. In the middle of this sentence, beginning of verse 14, in whom, his son, we have redemption, here's the key, the forgiveness of sins. He's redeemed us, the forgiveness of sins, bought us back. The songs were so providentially chosen this morning because so many of them dealt with this fact. And I hope if you didn't think of your sin, you need to occasionally think of it. Just to think about the fact that I don't have it anymore. Uh, It's gone. Forgiveness is a great word to release it, to let it go. A fiamai is to just, it's, it's gone. It's not attached to you anymore. And it's all happened through redemption. We don't use that word much anymore. Although next time you get a bottle of water or you get a can of soda or something, look for the CRV, California Redemption Value, and it'll have a little number next to it, right, which I think is five cents or whatever, five cents. And that redemption value is that's what that can is worth, and they'll buy it back to you for that, right? And and so that's why people collect it all and bring it in, and they get their money for it. And the the government says, or the, you know, environmentalists say, whatever, let's get it all, let's pay to get it back. It's like someone going to the redemption center, I think they still call them up, where you can take your stuff and it's paid for and you try to hold on to it, right? They pay you, they weigh it all out and they say, here, we're paying the redemption price and you don't let go of it. We well, have to let go of it. Why? Because it's theirs now. What are they gonna do with it? I don't know, they're gonna smash it up, melt it down, reuse it. They're gonna recycle it. Well, here's the thing, our sin so often, we like to hang on to it. I don't, ha- I don't have a problem with you remembering it from time to time. Paul did that. It says, I think about how bad I was, an insolent, I was a liar, I was a persecutor of the church. I was the worst. But God showed the release of this huge pile of sin in my life so that he could show that I am a perfect example of God's perfect patience. So that my sin, when I sing those lyrics, I can say they're not there anymore. They're gone, they're removed. 
The problem with our sin is it makes us feel guilty. It makes us feel guilty because we are guilty, but then we look at the gospel and we put our trust in Christ and we say all the guilt that I should feel, and we should think about that sin and say I should feel guilty, but here's the thing, I don't feel guilty because that guilt has been removed from me. If we get on the road and head to the hospital, our third little road trip, and today I'm gonna take you after chapel because you've got a huge cancerous tumor inside your, your torso and your surgery is scheduled for Friday. And I say, well, we're gonna go for the pre-op now, pre-op, and they're gonna go make sure they know exactly where it is. I know they're gonna have to bust open your sternum and cut you open and lay out your, your guts, and it's gonna be a terrible surgery, and that cancer is so bad inside that tumor that's growing in your body, but let's just go get ready for it. And we go there, and they go through all the diagnostics, and the tumor is gone, it's gone. They test you again, they send you through the magnetic resonance and it's gone, you don't have it anymore. Well, your surgery was already scheduled for Friday, but I know what we're gonna do when we're done with our diagnostic pre-op today. We're gonna make plans for Friday, something besides surgery, because you don't need it. And you would never say, well, let's just go through the surgery anyway, I guess it's already scheduled. There's no need for the surgery anymore. When you think of your sin, you should think of something, this mass inside of you called sin, and you think, you know, what it really deserves is what your guilt is trying to say you should get, and that is surgery on Friday. It is appointed a man wants to die, and then the judgment, that judgment should be mine, and I should be enslaved to fear over that, but Christ came to extract that. A lot of phantom pain with a lot of surgeries. It's gone, but you still feel it. People get their limbs cut off. I had a gal in our church that had all four limbs cut off. Horrific. And you have that phantom pain, like it's still there when it's not. I get that we struggle with sin, and guess who's throwing ketchup packets at you to make sure you think about it all the time? But the Bible says it's gone. How far? It was quoted. We quoted it today. I think Walt said it. As far as the east is from the west. How far is the cancerous tumor of sin from your life? As far as the east is from the west. He has redeemed you so that right now you stand before God judicially, forensically, completely, 100% forgiven. Now here's the thing about people that don't rejoice in that. They don't understand the gravity of the problem. Study your Bible, see the problem. And then you can say things like this, I give thanks to the Father who has qualified me to share in the inheritance of the saints and light. He's delivered me from the domain of darkness. He's transferred me into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom I have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Spafford's famous old hymn said it well, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, and they do. Let this blessed assurance, the anchor, Control, control my heart, control my disposition, control my attitude, control my words. That Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. Oh, my sin, this is a great verse. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole. Here's a line from Colossians. Was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. That is the difference between sour Christians and joyful, optimistic Christians. God wants to present you before his glory with great joy. We need more joyful Christians on this campus, in your dorm, in your home, in your church. May it start because we're saying thanks in a disciplined way every day in our Christian life. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.